Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where we thought one shadow was terrifying enough, but three? Oh boy. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Evo Dominguez is in the house, and what a chat we have on tap for you. We're going to talk a lot about shadow selves and shadow senses and elemental energy and get some tips on how to best connect with our own psychism. Evo is a practitioner of a variety of esoteric disciplines. He has been active in Wicca and the pagan community since 1978 and has been teaching since 1982. He was a founding member of the First Coven of the Assembly of the Sacred Wheel, a Wiccan tradition where he currently serves as one of its elders. Evo is also a professional astrologer who has studied astrology since 1980 and has been offering consultations and readings since 1988. He's also the author of five books, and his most recent is Keys to Perception, a practical guide to psychic development, which forms the basis for our chat here today. So let's do this damn thing already and pry open our subtle ears so we can hear the sweet, sweet sound of this consciousness-enhancing audio. Enjoy. Evo Dominguez, thank you so much for taking the time here. My pleasure to be on the show. Oh, no, no, no. The pleasure is all mine, believe me. So I have... Three basic questions here to start. Just yes or no, rapid fire style. <laughs> the first one, do you have psychic abilities? Yes. Does everyone have psychic abilities? Yes. Can you teach us how to tap into them? Yes. All right. Well, that's the end of the show. Thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> everything else, people just need to tune in with their minds. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So before we get into all of that, let's talk about you. Are you Cuban-American? Is that right? I am. And my family had a really bad habit of uh, having to uproot and move. My uh, grandfather's left Spain uh, during the Spanish Civil War because Franco was being uh, himself. And they moved to Cuba to get away from the Troubles and settled down and had married and got, had kids, and then Castro happened, and then we came here. And I remember as a child when JFK got shot, weeping and wailing and uh, pulling of uh, hair as the family was trying to decide whether or not we needed to uproot and move to Canada because mm. they didn't know if it was going to go bad again. So there's been a habit of moving about. So I'm going to assume something, and I'm sorry, but were you raised Catholic then? Oh, absolutely. I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my very devout and somewhat crazy Aunt Lydia, who, uh, I mean, had visions of the Virgin Mary, had stigmata upon one occasion. And uh, when my mother was going to die in childbirth uh, during the middle of the revolution, she ran out in the street with a kerosene lamp uh, during a machine gun fight, told the, the, the people that were fighting each other to stop so her sister could get to the hospital, and they stopped. That's pretty considerate of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just from my own curiosity then, is Cuban Catholicism different than other, I guess, Latin American or South American countries? So if the question is, did my parents torture the saints, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's what I was getting at. Yeah, you were. I remember as a child, I was the kind of kid that asked way too many questions about religion and spirituality and what was really going on. And I can recall with my mom and also for a time, both my grandmoms lived with us. You know, why they were, you know, why was that saint, statue of a saint in a, upside down in a glass of water? Why was there one buried in the backyard? You know, if, if, if I treat my toys that way, you get mad at me. What, why are you being mean to the saints? So, yes, uh, Cuban Catholicism, like most of uh, Latin American Catholicism, or frankly, any other kind of uh, religious practice, has what to an outsider's eye or even insider's eye is overt magic, overt ritual to accomplish specific ends. Yeah, you know, I am curious about that. I guess I'm also curious about why is it and this is, again, just for my own curiosity, why is the Spanish and Portuguese-speaking population, why are they so predominantly Catholic? I mean, I, I get that their ancestors came from the area where Catholicism, you know, was, was pretty popular, but why do you think that is still so popular in that part of the world? Well, aside from uh, lots and lots of uh, exploration of how religion and politics and uh, power can be used to enforce certain things, Aside from the politics of it, one of the things that Catholicism with a capital C or a small c has always done is to, to the degree that it was possible, to incorporate into itself or allow the incorporation into itself of whatever the local belief structures or customs were. 
which is why you know there's there's there are things that are specific to Irish Catholicism to to Polish Catholicism to Portuguese you know fill in the blank so I think that part of it was that at the same time that there was this overarching empire building model that had been there since since the earliest days and and, and Spain was a you know one of the biggest uh, empires uh, in its time so, so they knew how to do the empire building thing yeah and if you allow just enough flexibility to incorporate uh, existing things voila you have something that morphs into different things, but still feeds uh, the Church of Rome. So you mentioned the overt magic. What can you tell us about that specifically? What are you referring to? If somebody needed a particular kind of healing, there were specific things that you would do with, with the saints. Um, there were particular prayers and, and, and candles that you would light for specific uh, kinds of problems. There was a thing that happened uh, in my household and nowadays I would say, huh, it's interesting that they did it uh, near Bridget, Imbolc, uh, Candle Mass, you know, Santa Lucia, any number of things. But there was a thing that always happened in my household where, you know, February 1st, February 2nd, they'd be filling, you know, glass bowls with, uh, with clear water and, uh, and, and cracking an egg and just putting the white into the water and leaving it overnight for the next day for mom or grandma or aunts to be looking into the bowl of water and scrying to see what shape the egg white had taken floating in the water as a, a, a forecast for the coming year. And it was all timed with the blessing of the candles at the church. And, and frankly, I think uh, almost everybody in Latin America, uh, whether it's South America or Middle America or the, or the Caribbean, has some variation of uh, simple rhyming spells that your mom would would sing over you uh, when you when you sc- scraped your knee to uh, make your knee f- uh, heal faster you probably heard the uh, sana sana cola de rana chant that you know i, I don't know any i don't know any catholic kid uh, it, who who hasn't heard in, in latin america who hasn't heard some variation though in some parts of the world it's uh, it's uh, the tail of the frog in other it's the ass of the frog but those sorts of things are just woven through the whole culture the other bit is that despite the fact when people think of Spain, they think of the Spanish Inquisition and suppression of magic or suppression of witchcraft or, or alternative forms. At the same time, what most people think of as Hermetic Kabbalah today wouldn't exist without Spain. Why is that, um, you all, think? Why is that? You know, once upon a time, and I can say this because most of my ancestry is, uh, is from Spain, most of it northwestern Spain, actually. So once upon a time, for about 100, 150 years, the royalty in, in Spain were relatively sane, and there was a period in which the Jews, the Arabs, and the Christians all shared ideas, all shared knowledge. The whole glyph of the tree being ten circles connected with lines got invented in Spain. The idea of uh, most of, of, uh, of what you think of as modern hermetics being preserved and moved into alchemy started in Spain. There were schools of magic in Toledo, and then everything went went uh, pear-shaped and uh, the Jews were expelled were expelled, and everything went sour. But for a time, Spain had the equivalent of a uh, Alexandrian Library of Egypt moment where, where all the different disciplines of magic from different faith systems were together. And, and the part of Spain I'm from, or rather I should say my ancestors are, are from, I'm descended from, had a long history of, of witchcraft and and which is uh, you know keeping uh, invasions off the coast or, or or healing people such to the point that there are still all sorts of witchcraft festivals that occur and a lot of stuff that frankly looks very pagan if you scrape off the, the Catholic veneer. I mean, um, goodness sake, there's there's more there's more Bridget Wells in in northern northwestern Spain than there are in Ireland and the. Biggest town in Galicia is named Lugo after the god Lu. I mean, the Romans were there, the Phoenicians were there. So there's a whole lot more. It's 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 a much more complicated thing, and Catholicism picks up the flavor of wherever it is. Nonetheless, it it wasn't for me in the long run. Well, sure, you know, as you will, right? You know, my yeah. uh, my ex girlfriend. I was introduced to the the Hispanic Catholicism through her her, her family uh, is Mexican, so I got a, a healthy <laughs> dose of that when, when we were dating, and they were practicing overt magic. They did not oh, call yeah. it that, obviously, but they sure. were definitely doing what I can see now. You know, I didn't really know what magic was back then, but when I look back on it now, like, they were doing magical rituals for sure. Totally magic. That was totally magical rituals, and and there's also a big tradition there of uh, folk Catholicism which is another way of saying all the Catholic stuff that isn't approved of by the Church, but they can't quite exactly wipe out either. 
Yeah, yeah, like uh, like like Santa Muerte and some other figures like that, right? Or, 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 or Jesus Malverde or a bunch of other, or La Virgen de la Bala. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, there's also a bunch of holy people, uh, curanderos, people that are healers that, you know, aren't, aren't recognized as saints. But honestly, after the death of, uh, of uh, people that have been doing healing work in a community for a long time, their name has conjuring power, if you will, to, to something that you call upon for them to help with the healing, even though they're on the other side. So speaking of conjuring power, tell us the Evo Dominguez psychic ability origin story. Like, when did you uh, first discover that about yourself? Very young, when I realized uh, at, at a certain age, I would say it was uh, around, you know, five years old, maybe. I was at one of those kids whose birthday fell in just the right place so that I went straight to first grade when I was five, no kindergarten. And I discovered that my imaginary friends were very different than other people's imaginary friends and that some of them weren't so imaginary. And uh, what I took as normal of expecting when somebody would, you know, come through the door or when the teacher was about to do a pop quiz or whatever, all the little things that I thought was just normal, I discovered the other kids didn't do that as, as much. So there was an the inkling there. And as I became more aware of other kids and other things outside of my family setting, it became clear to me that my inner world, my inner experiences, and I obviously didn't use that language to myself as a child, was very different than everybody else. Or And I had, a grand, I had one grandmother who was very open to all things uh, metaphysical and spiritual, and another who was very hardcore, strict, just down the line Catholicism. And uh, they, they kind of like were an interesting pair in my life, but the one who was the true believer of, of the expanded reality, if you will, told me it's all real, it's all true, just don't tell people you'll get in trouble. And that was really good advice for me, mm -hmm. because I remember having a friend when I was a little kid in school get angry at me because I knew that uh, he had taken something of mine from my desk. And he said, well, you know, and he, he kept denying, denying, denying. And I said, okay, it's, it's in your backpack. It's in the bottom, bottom in the left. And, because I'd seen it. I'd seen that he had taken it and I saw where it was. And he was a little freaked out that I, that I saw it. But if you want to say the big turning point is when we were visiting at one point, eventually, my grandma uh, moved out and they had their own places, and one of my grandfathers uh, made it to the States. And we were visiting uh, grandma and grandpa, and, and uh, I was suddenly struck by the vision that he was going to die that night, and I made sure to spend extra time with him. I had an old, you know, reel-to-reel uh, -reel recorder, which was fancy tech in the day. It had been my, my one prized uh, Christmas gift, if you will. And I recorded a conversation with him, and, and, and you know, he died that evening, uh, died in his bed from a massive stroke, and mom and dad were kind of freaked out because I'd been telling them all day to, to make sure you spend time with granddad. He's going to die tonight. So over the years, it just became my normal that if a day doesn't go by, that several things don't happen to me that are experiences that most people would consider unusual, then I'm probably having a really off day. So for me, it's my normal. And at times it has gotten the better of me because it's it's uh, not always great to be receptive. So the whole, you know, don't tell anybody about this stuff yeah. because you'll get in trouble. Like that mentality. When did you just say, ah, fuck that. I'm, I'm going to go out and, and talk about it and learn more about it. And I guess at what well, point did, did you see that change both in your life and then maybe also culturally? Well, let's see. And, and, and just for a reference point for listeners, I'm a 1958 model, so I turned 60 this year. So my, my uh, experiences uh, overlap with a couple of different places in history that are less than open about lots of things. So good news, bad news was my father was a professor at the University of Delaware. So I had, uh, from the time I was a child, a library card uh, as a as a relative of him, so I could go in and take out books and read books that, honestly, I'm not sure I would have had any access to or even had the wherewithal to find them in the first place. So I did a lot of reading of some pretty heavy metaphysical stuff and, and even some. Uh, I remember reading uh, things about uh, Sufi and things about uh, Kabbalah and things about ceremonial magic as a as a you know tween. 
And of course, that meant I ended up buying my own books, buying my own tarot cards, and there'd be periodically the raids on my room and the removal of those objects, and more than once a a, a, a overly dramatic burning of said items in, in the backyard of my house uh, as uh, as some kind of object lesson. So, good or ill, what eventually uh, broke me completely out of the control of my family, you know, came just a few years later when I was uh, 18, but. But before we get to that story, I mean, I was there were four of us uh, when I was in high school, when I was you know 15, 16, that had already were, were already trying to do uh, evocations and 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 trying to use the uh, the Enochian keys in, in my friend Raymond's basement, whose parents were leftover hippies, and it was a concrete floor, so they let us paint whatever arcane symbols and sigils and crap we wanted on the floor, and as long as we didn't burn down the house, they didn't mind the the candles or the incense. So in a sense, uh, I was I was playing with fire in a lot of ways when when I was a young pup. Good news, bad news is 18, uh, just graduated high school, getting ready to go to college, and unbeknownst to me, my parents had been opening my mail, and they had uh, they were they were probably worried about a variety of things with me. So they opened a letter that was a love letter from a guy, and lo and behold, they had the major freak out. Oh my God, my son's gay. Blah blah blah. So. There was huge trauma, huge ugliness, lots of evil behavior on their part towards me, being basically held a prisoner in the house uh, during uh, the summer between uh, high school and college until I managed to escape and was then homeless for a couple of weeks until I hooked up with uh, parents of a high school friend. But during the peak of what was a, I will not get graphic, but they were being very abusive. Let's leave it at that. And I had a full-fledged out-of-body experience, was floating above my body, looking down at my body, and immediately had the realization that there was absolutely that nothing that they nor anyone else in the world could do to me that would actually harm the most important part of me. And then, you know, after a bit, descended back into my body and started plotting my escape. So thereafter, I, and, and, you know, from 18 on, I basically had to support myself, take care of myself, and was free to pursue all my interests however I wished. That's a hell of a story, man. You know, I did not yeah. know most of that. I've heard you talk about a couple of these things before, but I don't know if I've ever heard you tell that part of it. Oh, it, it, gets, a, it, gets, a, it gets a lot more interesting. I mean, they, they did, I did get kidnapped while I was in college for a weekend. But my parents had me taken to a deep programmer where they tried to ungame game me using the most unpleasant of means. You know, it was it was a long crazy trip. But on the other hand, I was free and emancipated and able to explore anything and everything that I desired. And in some ways, uh, that was uh, a gift though nothing ever reconciled with them. Though I will say something about, you know, the psychism. A number of years ago, and I had not spoken to my parents literally at that point I hadn't spoken to them at least 20 years and I started dreaming about my mother and I went okay mom's dying mom is sick now I had no contact them they had no contact with me their number was unlisted we had no way I knew they were still in Delaware because dad was still at the U of D so I had worked a great deal in AIDS HIV I was executive director for Delaware's AIDS HIV organization for a number of years so I called up my friends at Delaware Hospice and said, hey, slide me the information, you know, under the transom. Uh, is my mom in hospice? Is she dying? And, of course, the answer came back, yes. So, no, there wasn't any uh, deathbed reconciliation. Uh, neither she nor dad nor my sister wanted to see me. But I knew that when she was dying, I found out and verified it. And the night she actually passed, I, I felt exactly when it happened, and I verified with the hospice nurse later. So... When people ask, do you believe in this stuff, it's, it, that's not the right question because I've had too many things that have been evidential and verifiable for me. So it's not a question of, is it real? It's a question of, you know, how accurate is it? And, and, and how accurate is it? Meh, I do better than the weather forecaster, and, and, and uh, they claim to be scientists. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Although nowadays, I mean, uh, this weather's getting a little iffy for me. So... I should tell people why we're even here. You know, you've you've written yeah, right. a book recently. Yeah, you've <laughs> yeah. you've written a, you've written a book recently called "The Keys to Perception: A Practical Guide to Psychic Development." I guess first of all, I really enjoyed the book. It's a nice, I would say, introductory sort of how-to guide, perhaps, to developing psychic senses. Right? It is what I wish had been available to me when I was younger, and it is 
a summation of a lot of material that I've taught in workshops or in our covens over the years in a uh, portable and, and concise and orderly fashion. And there's a combination of both theory and practice in it because I don't think that there's value in having a cookbook approach to things without also having an understanding of how things work so that you can adapt them to your own needs. The other bit is that it does explore some things that are often left out, and uh, almost nobody comments or asks about it, but there are a couple of places where I speak to the value of also clamping down or controlling talents because uh, talents without control are, are really quite quite challenging and burdensome, and also about how to combine talents. Oftentimes people separate psychism or using the psychic senses from ritual magic, and in some regards, uh, some of the most useful material that I have found uh, has been gained with several people pooling their capabilities to uh, get clear, more complete uh, read on situations rather than acting as uh, single individuals, each doing a separate reading. Let me ask you this then. In our normal waking consciousness, yep. why don't we have access to our full psychic sight? I, I think it's because we are focused on survival. I mean, evolutionarily speaking, we're, uh, you know, somewhere uh, halfway between the, uh, the apes and the angels. And we learn to see when we're infants so that we know the shape of our bodies, so that we can move and negotiate with an environment, so that we know if something is about to hit us. We learn not to burn our finger. We try not to uh, fall over when we're running. We pay attention to the food so that we eat the right things and don't eat the things that are inedible. In a lot of ways, we filter out anything that isn't immediately a, a, a survival issue. Now, even in, that, even in a culture such as ours where it's not quite as, as difficult and not quite as wild as, as trying to uh, make it as a hunter-gatherer. Nonetheless, we still live in a world where there's a great deal of stress and a great deal of focus on the part of you that is speaking to me, the part of uh, the people that are listening to this podcast that is, that is convinced that its little slice of reality is the most important thing, and we never let our attention waver from this one frequency or this one channel or this one segment of, of reality for fear that if we let it stray, somehow things will go off the rails in a big way, so, which is why sometimes people inadvertently have a psychic experience when they're about to fall asleep or just waking up, or if they're really exhausted and uh, they, they don't have the capacity to hold on to the steering wheel of consciousness, so another part of them grabs the wheel and guides their perception to, to a more expanded universe. That's part of it. So, you know, why is, it, why is it so damn hard to access this then? I mean, you would think if it's, if it's sort of a natural part of our existence, you know, like even if it is our own fault for not being able to tap into it, like you would still think like it should be easier than it really is. I understand what you're saying, but we don't have a context for making it important. Attention and relative how we rank things as being important often determines what happens next. So, for example, how good are you at thinking without using words or images? Mm, not very good, because that's, that's, I guess that's how I think. I, I guess that's how everybody thinks, right? And And what I'm suggesting is that that part of us that thinks using words and images is perhaps the smallest sliver of, of, of who we really are. But we think it's the whole thing. That is a fair point, man. Let's think about this. Do you have trouble sometimes holding on to a dream? You had a really vivid dream and you wake up and within a short span of time, unless you write it down or repeatedly tell it to somebody, it begins to just dissolve into nothingness and the memory seems to fade and fade and fade? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I used to have that problem, absolutely, and it really annoyed me because I wanted to remember yep. some of those dreams. And I did not keep a dream journal, so I, I just lost them all. But I have started doing that recently within the past probably year or so, Ooh. and I noticed that as I you know, write down the dreams, my memory of them, even just over time, like even to now, like maybe if I wrote one down a year ago, it's almost more vivid and stronger than it was when yep. I first wrote it down. Yes. Because you have repeatedly told yourself, and it's trickled down to deeper 
levels of you, higher levels of you, depending upon your perspective, that it matters enough to be bumped up in the priorities so that you actually begin to retain it. We're always picking up psychic information, information that is uh, more expansive than what our five senses provide. But it, it, is this, it is similar to the process you just uh, mentioned with dreams. And another thing is we are, our, our waking consciousness has installed pop-up blockers and ad filters and that we don't realize that what we're blocking is our psychism. Ah, that's a great analogy, so, man. So, so until, until we convince ourselves that those things matter, they don't actually come up into our central view of consciousness in the same way that we have a focal point in our vision, uh, assuming, that, assuming that you're a sighted person, or if not, a, a sweet spot in your hearing if you don't see, then until something's in that sweet spot, either sound or, or, or sight, uh, we can't read it. We can't really attend to it. We know something's moving at the periphery of our vision or at the periphery of our hearing, but we can't quite lock into it. It is when we begin to shift the focus of our consciousness at the psychic stuff as opposed to the physical senses stuff, that we then bump it up in its priorities enough so that we can make it actually happen. One of the reasons why so many cultures have practices for their seers, their readers, their healers, or whatever, to get into a particular state of being or state of consciousness is it's a way of signaling to the whole complex of things that is our, our total consciousness hey, we are now focusing our center of attention on the other world rather than the one right before us. Okay, so you mentioned seeing and hearing, and there's a term out there that some people are probably familiar with called subtle energy. And yeah. there was a lot of great content in your book. And one of the things that stood out to me is that you wrote a lot about subtle ears. So what are subtle ears exactly? And how do we open them, I guess? So... Because we are a culture that focuses primarily on sight, we tend to give too much emphasis to that. But there are historically lots of people who have had great information come through something that they hear. The first thing is to actually focus on activating that hearing in the same way that people think of opening their third eye, then to the two bony spots behind your physical ears are the anchoring point for, for where the subtle energy is attached that connects to the psychism associated with hearing. And in a lot of ways, our, our, our bandwidth capacity in our wetware, in our brains, for sound is actually much more elaborate and much more, much more refined than our visual acuity. So that opening to hearing is, is, is very valuable. But in part of it is, this is going to sound dreadful to the people for whom this is wholly writ, but by simply pushing energy to the places behind the ears, imagining the vortices, the, the lotuses, the roses, however you visualize the chakras, opening up behind each ear, over time, they will become real. Those connections will be made between your physical body and all the subtle layers in between. Because I'm going to say that, you know, in, in a lot of ways, everything that we know about the chakras uh, or the energy field, the human body, is just like a skin wrapper that you put on a piece of software or a collection of icons that you use to act as the interface between you and uh, summoning the power of, of the programs that live in your computer. They are a construct. Not that there isn't an underlying reality to our, phys to our subtle bodies, our energy bodies, but the symbols that we use for them are installed by repetition. Subtle hearing is, is uh, very valuable, though I will say in this culture, there are people that have a problem with letting that open because we traditionally have the notion that if people hear things, they're crazy. Right. You know, you mentioned how sound was, I guess, a bit more complex than yeah. vision, right? And I pulled a quote out here in your book. To that point, you wrote that often psychic impressions have many layers of information that are related to each other in a complicated web of relationships that each contribute to the meaning of the impression. And then you also wrote that hearing, in some regards, is much more nuanced than seeing and can decode some types of psychic impressions much more effectively. And sure. I never really thought of it that way. I, I knew that sound had many layers to it, obviously, because like as we're talking right now, for example, my voice is producing sound. But when it comes out, like when that sound exits my mouth, it doesn't stop. It's still sort of lingering out there somewhere, right? And maybe someplace somebody can pick it up or whatever. But I am curious, like, so have you done this before? And I guess, have you opened your subtle ears? And what's the difference between what sort of, I guess, noise you're picking up? 
You know, it's more than just noise. And, and though I will say that sometimes I experience uh, full, full-fledged words in conversation, but sometimes it's a question of, let's say that I, I, I am sensing the, the presence of a, of a spirit or an entity in a room. And, I, and sometimes I can see a little blob of energy or something that, 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 I, that I can visually tune into, but sometimes it's a matter of simply listening to the energy of the room because every space has its own acoustics. Where is this, the energy sound muffled? Or, ah, I can hear that a sound is coming from, from my left and it's about uh, five feet in the air. Sound gives you 3D perception in a way that vision does not. So when you're trying to scan what's going on energetically around you and you are listening to it as a sound, you know if the, if the walls are hard, you know if the walls are soft, you know if the sound is coming from above or below to the left of you. So that in, in some ways you can think of it as uh, energetic echolocation as well. So there's a lot more nuance to it. And there are times when I will experience two or three different sounds simultaneously as a way of something speaking. And it's, it's not unusual to find lore where you'll find spiritual entities being depicted as, as speaking with three voices at once or two voices at once or any number of voices at once. And I think that's part of it is, is that, that there's a multiplexing of information. There's more than one kind of information passing at once. I think one of the problems with psychic perception when people open up is that it's actually so much at once that it just turns into the equivalent of white noise. Have you ever had any sort of experience where, like, I don't know, can you see sound on some level if you develop your psychic senses enough? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I, though I, though I, think I, I should say that uh, all psychic perception is, is uh, poetic license and metaphor, because we're, we're taking, until we learn how to be lucid and aware beyond the limitations of representational and notational consciousness that relies on words and, and images, then all psychic impression is stuff that has been compressed, resampled to a smaller bit rate so that it will fit within the contents of, of what we call consciousness and, and, and perception. So I have experienced what look like like vibrating waves of color that are all that one c- I also experience as sound. I've also experienced smell as well with, with certain things, and, and smell is a very powerful one because in a lot of ways, if I smell something and it means a particular thing to me, good, bad, or indifferent, I trust it more immediately because it's harder to fool that part of me that is uh, so deeply rooted in, in, in the uh, reptile brain and the lower uh, evolutionary chunks of us. Yeah, and I should have mentioned too, like you do write about subtle smell and taste as well, but yeah. for some reason the the subtle um, sound with the subtle ears was a, a bit more interesting to me, I guess. I'm not sure why, but although I'm sure they're all equally valuable. Can you imagine going out where we were on a trip together to Ireland a number of years ago and uh, did the whole sacred sites thing as well as eating eating too much cheese and drinking too much uh, Jameson's and we would go to different sacred sites, and a lot of times people would say, Evo, Evo, where are the hotspots? Where are the places I should go check out the energy, blah, blah, blah. And in some cases, I would glance across the field and say, okay, I, I see you know, a, a column of light rising from over there. Why don't you check out that place? But sometimes I wouldn't get any visuals, but I could close my eyes and just focus on the sound. And I said, there's a big rushing sound coming from from uh, just beyond uh, those three stones, why don't you try over there? So I find for, for, for checking out a large environment, especially outdoors, the psychic hearing is, is uh, particularly potent. I wonder why that is. Is it just because there's not as much pollution or distraction or whatever? Like it, you, there, there's no competition for your senses maybe or, or less competition? You know, I, I don't know if it's less competition but it's much more orderly. If you're out in nature, there is a natural pattern that evolves between all the living things and all the, the stones, the water, the trees, the plants, to, to establish a, a pattern that's uh, cohesive and orderly within that particular place and time. Whereas unless it's a carefully planned cityscape, you know, it's, it's, it's moderately chaotic and the energy gets bounced around in funny ways and people are moving energy and machines are moving energy and buildings are cutting across places where there was a natural flow of energy or life before. So it's a little bit less orderly, which means that it takes a while to pick through it. It's like uh, when you're in nature, you are looking at something that is the equivalent of 
a well-designed magazine or a well-designed website where it is intuitive to know where to look next as opposed to a randomly created overlapped uh, space where there is no governing design principle. Yeah, okay. So this makes me think of a point I wanted to touch on later, but I think since we we're talking about nature maybe here, it might be a good sure. time to just sort of transition into it. But I, I wanted to talk about elemental energy and what that is specifically. You know, like obviously it correlates to the four classical elements, you know, fire, water, air, and earth. But it seems like there might be some confusion on what is this this elemental energy specifically. It gets confused, I think, with chi or prana. What is the difference here? It is confused because... Most people's first exposure to teaching about the elements in a magical context, for example, tends to be still focused on what on human needs. Uh, We associate the elements with particular states of consciousness or emotion or purpose or will or desire or mind or, you know, it's all the correlations or all the associations are still human centric. And even when we speak of elementals or consciousnesses within the elements, they're still very much if not anthropomorphized, vivamorphized, turned into something that's comparable to a living item that we would understand. The universe is a lot bigger. I would say that uh, the reason there's a confusion is, let's let's think about plants and animal, vegetable, mineral. Do you remember that uh, game ever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 25 questions. Yeah. All right. In other words, let's start with the three classic kingdoms. So, So that if you want to think of pure elemental energies, the pure elemental energies exist in the realm of of mineral life, of somatotic particles, of the four basic forces of the universe, you know, electromagnetic force, weak force, strong force, gravitation, blah, blah, blah. And then you have, but but the elements there are are not the elements that we can use as living beings, which is uh, if you tried to plug into those elements, you would fry and die because we need... We need stuff that's soft and warm and cuddly like prana or chi or or life force as we know it. So things like plants take the the four elements in their raw form and through the magic of of, uh, photosynthesis, they do what? They turn the elemental forces into life force, into prana. It is now elemental energy that has been warmed and humidified and turned into the temperature that the human body can absorb or that other mammals or other plants. So that basically you have a cycle where elemental energy looks different, acts different, but is it, the next step of it as it moves from one realm to the another. So as it goes from the animal realm to the plant realm to the animal realm, it's still elemental energy, but it takes on different qualities and properties because It is adapted to the needs of that expression. There are beings that are just the elements, and some of them are really not likely to ever communicate with us because I'm not sure we have a whole lot to say to the... uh, to the uh, uh, elemental of the fire of nuclear fusion at the core of the sun. So have you heard of the idea of the four holy living creatures? You know, I, I don't think so. What What is that? So if you look at the world card on the tarot, in the Rider Waite Coleman, Pixie Pamela Coleman's deck, mm. uh, we can't f- forget her name, you'll see that in the corners of the world card for the tarot, you have the eagle, the, the bull, the man. Do you remember seeing those? Yeah, I just pulled the card out of my deck here. Sweet. So most of the time people say, oh, well, those are the four fixed signs of the Zodiac, or, oh, no, if, if you're, if you're a, a, a Christian uh, magic user type, you're going, no, 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 those are the four evangelists. No, 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 those are the four archangels. Or you can look at it as, you know, they are the four beings that at the very highest, most expansive, and I, I kind of like expansive more than higher because people get hung up on up, down, left, right with, uh, with, with dimensions that don't exist. They are the thing that anchors divine consciousness or or spirit into physicality so you can think of the four elements as the four tent at their highest form as the four holy living creatures that surround the throne of god if you're doing the abrahamic route though there's other ways of conceptualizing it that's the way that mind and brain at the level of the universe can happen it's the thing that binds consciousness that is of a spiritual nature to consciousness that is in in anchored and sold in matter. So when you talk about the elements, man, it, it can go from the very hugest thing that is how the universe is, can, can remain one, one whole thing and why you can have mischievous little uh, air selfs that are, that are messing with your kite. <laughs> yeah. So is there a surefire way, and that might be a pun actually, 
But is yeah, there yeah. a surefire is there a surefire way that we can discern this elemental energy? Obviously, we have to develop or have some development of our psychic senses to be able to discern the energy in general. But of, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of it is work with what we have that's physical first. For example, if I back to fire your surefire approach, if I had a lit candle in front of me, I have a proxy, I have a stand-in, I have a representative for the element of fire. However, and this is the part where it gets dicey, though you can, you can examine the energy, you can interrogate the energy, you can, you can try to commune with it, you can try to have conversation with it. The relationship of that flame and that candle to fire with a capital F is like the drop of soul or the spark of divine fire that exists in you. It's one tiny piece that came from the whole and is currently incarnated in you. And for a moment, fire with a capital S is incarnated in that little flame on the top of that candle. So you can use the physical elements, a bowl of water, you know, standing in the breeze or, or moving a feather. You can use those things so long as you don't make the mistake of believing that, that uh, the fire that you see before you on the physical plane is the same thing as, as the fire with a capital F. In the same way, you need to remember that though your body is a wonderful and important thing, it's not all of you and it's not even the biggest part of you. So can these different elemental energies then, can they interact with each other? Can they be observed oh, interacting yeah. with each other? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and in some ways, this is a lot like learning to see colors. Let, let's compare it to something. So my partner, Jim, everybody complains, he must be colorblind. He's not. He's got perfect color vision. He's been tested lots of times. However, if you ask him, you know, what, what color is that thing over there? It's green or it's blue, he'll say. And I'm going to take a look at it and go, no, that's teal. How come? Well, depending on how the light hits it, he's going to decide, I'm going to pick one of the two names. It's got to be either green or blue. I have a specific name for what that is because I've spent time looking at colors and identifying this is the name. Ah, this is the difference between, between you know, bubblegum pink and cherry pink. It's almost like you have to spend enough time, and there's no way around this part of it. You actually have to spend time exploring the elemental energies to begin to see nuances and differences between them. When people come to my house, they often will look, I have three dogs right now, and they'll go, wow, how do you tell them apart? They look so much like each other. And I'm, in my head, I'm going, are you crazy? Where, whereas, where I say, don't you see how wide that nose is compared to this one? Don't you see how, how this one is, is, is so much more, you know, lanky and slender compared to this one? It's like, it, it's about actually learning to see. And, and actually, a lot of, if, if there was an overall theme, and, and actually a friend of mine said that, uh, who is uh, a self-proclaimed leadhead, they don't believe that they have much of uh, much psychism of any sort, though I will argue the reverse with them often. But they said that, you know, they were going to read the book and, and, they, and they got about halfway through and they said, you know, I don't know if I'm doing anything better psychically, but I'm noticing a whole lot more things around me. Because part of the work of the book is learning to pay attention to the world. There's exercises related to, you know, looking at a piece of art for a, what feels like an inordinately long period of time in order to actually see what's going on. I've told the story too many times, but I had an experience in an art class in college where the grad student, uh, the evil grad student at uh, the time I thought he was, you know, put a white table with a white tablecloth and a white ceramic bowl and it had marble white marble balls in it and white light bulbs and everything was white on white on white and he told us that we had to use all the colors in the palette to uh, paint what we saw before us and it was daunting until we actually all took a look and realized oh there's a slight yellow cast from the lights in the, in the ceiling oh there's a little bit of a blue hint coming from the north window in, in the classroom oh, actually, that's not pure white, is it? The closer I look, it's got a tiny, 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 tiny little bit of orange in it. It's like a peach, peach pastel. But until we actually looked, we didn't see it. A lot of times when you begin to see the interactions between elements or elementals, it's because you've been looking at the elements and looking for them long enough that they no longer look like the same. Oh, they're just, all, all three dogs look the same. All the things on that bowl look white. Not really. Not when you look closer. Yeah, and I've I've seen this this elemental energy described in other places as as like the the true occult language of like Western based Western based systems. I guess for yeah. lack of a better term, it's it's one of the anchoring. That's what it, you can think of it as four pillars that uphold it all. Or you could think of it as the four uh, tent pegs that hold the tent down, or or the anchoring points for for the knowledge. I mean, there it's disseminated through all of it because. 
that's the way manifest reality works. Yeah, so let's go from the, the four elements yeah. to the three selves. This this was another section of the book that I really enjoyed. And, and on this topic, you wrote yep. that, quote, in music and in art, there are many perfectly workable schemes for dividing up yep. sound and light into keys and color wheels. Some variation yep. on the threefold self, a tripartite division of the psyche into something akin to the primary color, shows up in a wide range of traditions. Knowledge of the three selves is very useful for gaining access to and control of the the inner senses. So first off, I, I like the subtle comparison to the division of the self and the division of sound and light, because that is essentially what makes up our universe. So as far as the three selves go, though, what are those three divisions exactly? Well, the simplest ones are the lower self or primal slash animal self, the middle self, which is the thinking, talking, uh, present in the day-to-day -day life self, and the higher self or divine spark or God self. Those are the three broad divisions, and they show up in a lot of different cultures. Um, for, for people that are Kabbalah geeks, um, they go, well, what about the four worlds? Well, you know what? Basically, it's still a threefold model because you, you've tacked on absolute uh, the, at the very top, which is the closest to the primal nature of reality, and you can't go there anyway. So it is also the three worlds that show up most commonly in, in, in a broad range of cultures, the underworld, the middle world that we walk upon, and, and the overworld, or the heavens. So that, there's a, that pattern is, is a, is a well-worn pattern that shows up in a lot of systems. It also has you know, echoes that have shown up in psychology. There are echoes that show up in any system that tries to make sense of things. That's one of the comparisons to the three primary colors is the idea is from those things, when they are mixed together, all things arise. And it also is a way of considering uh, the value of all three, because one of the things that I see or have seen is that sometimes the middle self will get short shrift, or there'll be a lot of talk about how to progress spiritually or magically, you have to either do away with the ego or tamp it down or control the, the chattery monkey brain while you're trying to meditate. And as a result, there's often a tendency to open up more to the primal self, the lower self, or open up more to the, the higher self or, or the God self or the divine spark self as a way of getting access to our senses and capabilities. And that's great. It's a good shortcut. But it is the middle self that knows how to translate it into stuff that is useful in this world so long as we're incarnate. So unless you're working with all three, and compared to something else, uh, if you could imagine an imaginary engine that has three cylinders, if all three cylinders and all three pistons aren't working well, the engine's going to run really rough, which is what often happens when there isn't uh, adequate attention to the development of all three layers of consciousness. That's an interesting point. Are you familiar with the model of the triune brain? Is, is that similar to what yeah, we're talking about? I actually, I actually think that, that if, you, if by the triune brain you mean the reptile, mammal, and, uh, and primate brain? Yeah, yeah, pretty model, much. Model, yeah. Then, then I would say, yeah. And I actually think that, there is an, that there's a reason why... Now, you, you, you can play a chicken and egg around this as to whether the, we're, we're prone to develop uh, the, the three-self model because our brain operates in that way that we have those three levels, and they each operate independently at the same time that they operate together. So yeah, part of it is th the three brains are, are there. Though, by the way, one could all, there's a different way of looking at the three brain model, and, and one, one of my teachers said that it's just as important to think laterally as well as vertically. So in addition to the up-down uh, orientation of the reptile and, and uh, mammal and primate brain, you also have the left brain, the right brain, and the corpus callosum, which is for all intents and purposes, the third brain. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of it too in terms of like, I had a guest on the end of last year where we talked a bit about this, but we were talking about it in like the actual physical sense, like you have the brain stem, the limbic system, and then the <laughs> frontal lobe, and that was like emotion, sensation, and logic. Would you see that in a similar way then? That, that's a different way of describing the, the reptile brain, the uh, 
uh, mammal brain and the primate brain. That's a different terminology for the same. That there's another there's there's another set of three to think about because you actually have three large clusters of neural tissue in the body. You have the brain, you have the spinal column, and then in the gut you have actually a little bit more neural tissue in your gut than you actually do in your spinal column. So because the you you basically have a, a body brain that is where everything's offloaded that's related to to running the organs and running digestion and making sure that everything is going properly internally. So when people say they have a gut feeling or that they there, there's activity going there, so you actually have three separate areas where brain activity is taking place, or I should say mind activity is taking place. And I think that the gut brain is one of the reasons why there's so many cultures that place value on the solar plexus or the dantian or the hara or that lower core of as, as being a place of power spiritually. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but I read a book a few years ago called The Mind-Gut Connection. Changed my life, Evo. Like That that really opened my eyes into my own biology really for the first time and, yeah. and definitely convinced me to change my diet too. So, you know, you also pointed out around this topic that the higher self is not always the better self. I was curious what you meant by that exactly. Well, I actually give a class on the uh, on the shadow of the higher self. Actually, I give a class called the triple shadow, which examines the shadow of each of these. But let's let's think about it for a minute. The higher self is not in charge of your personal evolution. You know, we incarnate, and this is this is theology so in belief. Uh, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. You don't have to believe any of it. But you are incarnate for a reason. You are here to do whatever it was that you're supposed to do, or learn whatever it was that you chose to sign up for or were, was suggested to you that you do. And the context is about here and now. Let's think of it this way. The, there are plenty of stories about goddesses, gods, entities being relatively unconcerned about the needs of the physical world or the needs of existence. Because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's okay, kid, you're going to die, but it's all right, you'll end up in this heaven or we'll send you back for another lifetime or whatever. There isn't a valuing of the absolute powerful beauty of briefness and ending, and that's in the domain of the middle self. The higher self can give you a perspective of the broad view of, of the universe, can act as your secret decoder ring to communicate with beings or energies that are highly different from you because it is closer to that place where things connect. So it still has resonance and connection to them. But if you want to actually live in while you're embodied, the middle self is where it is. And, and people that try to dwell too much in the higher self live for the future or live for tomorrow or live for the the, the uh, end that comes beyond living, and that in and of itself is, is kind of a premature death. There's a lot of ways in which the highest levels of consciousness, how about this? Too much emphasis on the higher self is, is, uh, or the highest form of consciousness can become like a drug that is addicting and takes you away from the things that uh, have value in the here and now. Spending too much time at the level of the lower self is also like a drug that, that can take you away from paying attention to what matters because you are lost in the sea of sensation. You're lost in the sea of bliss or of, of profound emotion. To compare it to something mundane and magical, I had a friend who I had a long, hard chat with a number of years ago because he went to a lot of spiritual festivals, camp out events, pagan events, and he basically spent all of his time drumming and dancing at the fire circles, which is a lovely thing, and I like doing that too. But he said to me, you know, with, with you know, very clear eyes that, you know, this was his spiritual path. And after about, you know, five, ten years of absolutely nothing changing in his life, I said, you, you do understand that, you're, that all you're doing is going to these fire circles and dancing and drumming because you like the buzz that it gives you, but have, has anything changed? It's kind of like, you know, sitting on the island and eating the lotuses. It doesn't matter whether they're the lotuses that are the lower self lotuses or the starry ones that uh, come from, from above. It's, it's when all three of them are in agreement. How about this? It's only when, when all three of them are in agreement that you, you have higher mind and higher heart joining to become the one thing that is you. I guess that's why, you know, the balance of anything is always in the middle then, right? The middle is an important place and the middle yeah. self matters. Absolutely. It's, it's sort of like a lower and higher self compromise in some way. This is where they meet. <laughs> exactly. And it wouldn't be a podcast of mine if we didn't talk about shadow selves, which you were talking about there for a few moments. And I mean, we talk about that quite frequently on this show, because I personally, I really do see magic and alchemy and, and art and psychology as mm -hmm. all like 
modalities of, of coming to terms with the shadow self and also helping to integrate it. But there is a lot of fear of those shadow selves, and you did write a bit about that fear. Why are we so afraid of the dark, Evo? Well, sometimes sometimes we'll find out what we have done. Sometimes the, the uh, gift that we give ourselves that's it's not actually a gift is oblivion or forgetfulness or lack of awareness when we, we, when we don't understand the context or the outcome of the things that we've done. That makes us feel okay for the moment, but it's pushed it off into a place within us that will eventually uh, arise and, and, and come back. You, you can't plant seeds in, in the dark earth of, of, of consciousness without them growing. So part of, part of the reason that we're afraid is that uh, there is no such thing as, as an easy way through. And all of us have caused harm to ourselves and to others. So that the more aware you become, the more you have to develop capacity for forgiveness, for healing, for the capacity to move through. And I actually think that the way it works is that uh, the brighter your light gets, the longer and darker your shadow gets, just like in the physical world. You know, dim light, not much of a shadow, but the brighter the light, the, the more distinct the shadow. And it's kind of like a tree whose roots have to be as big downwards as, as the branches reach upwards to stay in balance. But shadows also, you know, it's not all bad stuff, but, but we can also, because we can also be afraid of just being powerful. Just being powerful is a fearful thing because if for whatever reason we do not trust ourselves, actually, I think it's several times in the book I speak to the idea of one of the things that can prevent you from having access to your psychism is that you don't think you merit it or that you believe that if you had it, you wouldn't use it for good reasons or good ends. So that if you don't trust your capacity to use power, you will freely give it away. If you don't trust your capacity to hold on to particular pieces of knowledge or memory that are about you, then you will try to, uh, you know, put them in a little boat uh, like a baby and throw them in the river. Well, that baby eventually, you know, grows up and becomes uh, some kind of important figure, at least in most of the stories of the baby in, in the boat. That's the way it plays out. But the shadow comes back that way, too. Yeah. There's really nothing more than the old know thyself. And, and to the degree that you know yourself and have chosen to figure out how to understand and love or make peace with or feel or work with, but you don't ever actually get rid of shadow. And that's actually, uh, you know, uh, Ursula Le Guin of Blessed Memory. And I recommend it often. If you haven't read her Wizard of Earthsea trilogy, you don't have to read all of the books in the series, but at least the first three, The Wizard of Earthsea and then onwards, the next two. Those are kids' books that, that, that teach profound lessons about the shadow and about magic. And ultimately, they have to be embraced. I had the uh, unique pleasure of getting to meet her briefly when I was a young pup. And, and that uh, is, is on my list of uh, squee moments forever. <laughs> I yeah I can imagine man I bet she would have been quite a trip to hang out with just even for a, a, a brief moment. I I was uh, I was in my I think I was 19 when I met her and uh, she was standing outside a hotel at a science fiction convention standing outside you know smoking her pipe and holding court with the people that were that were standing about her. That's really cool man. So I don't want to take a tangent here, but did you Go grow up it. reading reading sci-fi and fantasy then? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that science fiction and fantasy, uh, at least in the last several decades, uh, have, have uh, definitely been like the gateway drug for most people to find their way into magic. It's rare when I find someone, they exist, but, but for the vast majority of people I know that are active practitioners, and, and especially the serious ones today, have a, a profound love of science fiction and fantasy because you know, they're, they're the current equivalent of myth-making. I'd actually suggest that even when it's serious writers of, of magic nonfiction, there's probably just as much useful material to be gleaned from Dion Fortune's fantasy novels than from her actual serious books. Like the difference be between looking at uh, a, a, a uh, choreography for a dance on a piece of paper and then sitting and watching the dance. Fiction allows you to see it in motion. It's a good way to put it, yeah. I was going to share a quote here, too. There's a beautiful passage here that I just wanted to share real quick before we get too far sure. away from it. You wrote that, quote, All the parts of self have lights, shadows, and more that we are yet to know or name. Just as one of the goals in spiritual development is the integration of the three selves, so is the integration of the shadow of each part. And here's the bit I really like. I believe the shadow is the matrix of the self, the connective mm -hmm. tissue that joins the parts, the night sky within that lets our stars shine. It is part of your being, then it is part of the universe within you. 
I thought that was great. I don't have a question about this. I totally agree. No. But if you want to say something about that, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I actually think that any time that a group of people say is sitting together around, uh, around a fireplace, sitting, chatting, feeling a sense of warmth and connection be- between each other, that's the shadow also. When you see a group of uh, birds in flight that suddenly all, all 10,000 starlings or whatever they are suddenly shift and move as one, that's the shadow. When a school of fish moves together to flee a predator, that's also the shadow. Because the shadow communicates faster than the light can, because it's actually the matrix of things. It actually is. When you ask, you know, how is everything in the, inter- in the universe interconnected? How can it be that all things touch each other even though the stars part? Because it's the shadow that's touching everything. That's a great explanation, man. I never thought of it that way. So you mentioned science fiction and fantasy. Obviously, those are products of, on some level, of the imagination. And I'm curious, I also threw out the term subtle energy when we were talking about subtle hearing Mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. What's the difference to you between subtle, real subtle energies and our imagination? Do you have any insight here? Our imagination uh, operates at a particular kind of level of subtle energy or subtle matter. When we imagine, when we visualize, when we have emotion, the place where those fleeting or sometimes not so fleeting images or forms exist, to me, is in the place that some people would call the astral plane, that some people would call the sphere of Yassad, that some people would call the dreaming. And you can take that dreaming to either be a a tip of the hat to Australian Aboriginal religion or a tip of the hat to the Endless and uh, Sandman series. It's it's a particular frequency. It's a particular level of density. Um, There's a teaching in a lot of Western magical traditions that the thought of one level of reality is the matter of the next. So that if you look at the plane right above us, the uh, astral plane or or the sphere of Yassad or whatever, what's thought there. Is the, it becomes matter here. What counts as subtle energy or subtle matter in that plane is actually the thought of the plane above it. How about this? Subtle matter and subtle energy is like spirit going through phase changes. So, for example, water can be a, a vapor, a liquid, or a solid. Yes. Imagine then that, uh, in a, this is, you know, I'm making a comparison, that consciousness can be a vapor, a liquid, or a solid, depending upon which plane of reality you're looking at it. So, all spirit is one, all matter is one, all energy is one, but it behaves differently according to, to uh, how excited it is or how dense it is. So I guess around the same point, I've, I've done a few shows recently where we've talked about emotion and sensation. How do we know that we're sensing our own emotions then and not just somebody else's, you know, maybe subtle energy? Well, the example I like to give is that most human beings uh, don't have perfect pitch. You know, I do have friends that have perfect pitch. You, they can tune a, you know, a violin by ear. If you ask them to sing uh, A sharp, they can open up their mouth and out comes A sharp. But for the most part, we don't have that. Maybe at best we have decent tonal memory. We sort of remember who we are and, and what we are and what we're feeling. And that's why you have to have techniques in order to remind yourself. So, for example, I describe an exercise uh, in the book where basically you end up moving inwards instead of grounding and centering to the external world, where you move inwards to your inner landscape, the place that is you, has been you since before you were born, the place to which you'll return after you pass from this world, and to ground and center yourself within there to remind yourself, this is who I am. This is what I feel like. And also to develop habits of uh, how to lock yourself back into into uh, this world of, of, of mundane stuff and to be mindful of how was I feeling immediately before I stepped into this room? What changed when the following individuals entered? Is there any logical reason that uh, I should be experiencing what I'm experiencing or is it something that changed? So it, it becomes a, a collection of workarounds, a collection of techniques in order to stay on track with what's mine, what's not mine, what am I feeling that's my emotion or my thought pattern and what's coming in from others? And then learning how to reestablish clear and clean boundaries between the inner and the outer, knowing that that's always limited because unless you're, you're, a, you're a sociopath, you're going to be impacted by what occurs around you or unless you've achieved a level of detachment and equanimity that would, that would make a Buddhist monk blush. Is it possible that we're just training our five physical senses to experience more than usual, and, and maybe we're just labeling that as some sort of psychic ability? That's true for some of it, 
And, and when that happens, that's excellent because you're actually more present in the world. But, but, but I think for most people, that's not where it ends. It becomes more than that. And it also doesn't explain things. So quite a few years ago, my, my other half, Jim, was almost uh, gay bashed to death on the other side of the world. He was away doing work in uh, Africa at the time, uh, though I will point out that it was a American Marine that did the bashing. And I suddenly got a wave of nausea and I had to sit down and uh, I popped a blood vessel in, 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 uh, in my left eye. And I knew that something dreadful had happened and it was, you know, quite a few hours later until I, I got a phone call. But that kind of communication is, is not something that my five physical senses could have possibly experienced. Knowing my mother was dying, knowing within an hour of uh, when she actually passed physically. Tonight, just before the call, you know, I've, I've been told that messy desks are a sign that you're actually doing good things, but at least I'll take that as truth. <laughs> but uh, I have this thing when, when something is lost in the house, and Jim needed to find something for, for a call that he had for one of his consulting gigs. I have this thing where, where I'll just wiggle fingers of my left hand and just hang my left hand out in front of me and, and say, take me to wherever it is. You know, like a, he needed to find a particular piece of paper. Who knows where it was in the house? So I just let it tug me to where it was. I have found rings. I have found tools. I have found all manner of things. And basically, I'm dowsing with my left hand, just hmm. dangling my fingers in the air and letting it drag me. That's not the five senses. Now, if you, were, if you were a real hard-ass about it, you could argue, well, on some level, you have memorized the location of every single object in your house. Well, I mean, yeah. no, because like you said, if, if something's lost and it's not in its usual place, then it's or it in has nothing to do with memory. Under, I had, I had a, a, a friend call me, this was about a couple of years back, maybe actually three years ago. So Diana, who is a, a, a type A, take over the universe, businesswoman, flips houses, runs too many businesses simultaneously, decided that she was getting rid of cable, getting rid of the satellites. Damn it, she was cutting the cord and just going to watch whatever she could pick up on an antenna on her TV. Well, she got in her, interrupted in her process by a phone call, and then she could not, for the life of her, find her car keys. And, and she had to borrow her husband's keys, and it was a mess. So she was desperate, and she called me up, because she's not really a believer in this stuff, and said, Evo, Evo, Evo. Help me find my keys. So I closed my eyes and I'm, you know, walking around her house in my head trying to find her keys for her. And I said, it's in the bedroom. And do you have plants in your bedroom? Because I keep seeing the keys and they are under a leaf. They're under a leaf. I don't have any plants in my bedroom, blah, 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 blah. A couple of days later, she texts me. I found the keys. They were under a leaf, sort of. So the box for the amplified antenna that she had bought to attach to her TV, the company's called Leaf, and its logo is this big giant leaf. And she had put the box right on top of her keys, so I was seeing a leaf, <laughs> and the keys were underneath the leaf. There you go, man. Jeez. But the, but the, the limitation there is, you know, I, I could see that they were in her bedroom. I could see that they were under a leaf in her bedroom, but... Whether it was my miscommunication or the, lit the literal nature of it was that she didn't have any plants in her room, so she assumed it was wrong until she realized that, oh, there's a big giant leaf logo on this box. So that sounds almost like remote viewing on some level. Uh, well, that would be the term that, that some would apply to that. Other people would just call it clairvoyance. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you must be psychic then, because my next question was about clairvoyance. You know, one area that I've always been curious about has been things like clairvoyance, but also, you know, clairaudience and clairsentience. I guess I'm interested in all the clairs, and I, I know these terms are, they're all independent of each other, but is this what you're you're really writing about in the book, or is clairvoyance and clairaudience and clairsentience like something completely separate? They are all related, though, though I also make reference to what I call the noirs, which is the psychic senses that don't show up bright and shiny in your consciousness like sound or light or smell. But I would say that they are all expressions of the same thing. I think all psychism is just a consequence of having a spirit anchored in physical form. And which flavor it takes and how it works its way into a person's waking consciousness, into their awareness, that's partly temperament and partly training and partly genetics and partly three trillion other things. But I view it as one thing that manifests as many possible expressions. 
you know, dangling my fingers in the air to find objects that, I, that that's kind of like one of my little signature things that I do around the house or at friends' houses. That's not clairvoyant. That's not any of the clairs. It's a noir because I'm not seeing anything. I'm not hearing anything. I'm just letting my hand drag me to where the thing is. Would you describe then the noirs? I mean, those are then like kind of, I guess, like the, the shadow versions of our psychic senses or the, yep. the shadow versions of, of our five senses, maybe? They, they, they can be, or I would say that they are the ones that do not express with sound or light or, or verbiage. They don't show up in your waking consciousness. They are the, the reason that you turned left instead of right for no other reason than you just felt like it, but there was a good reason. The reason that uh, when somebody's using a, a pendulum or doing automatic writing, they don't know what's going to happen. It just happens. It bypasses, to some degree, the uh, normal waking consciousness, and to that degree, it is in the realm of shadow, because it's not something that we have in our full waking awareness. But it still shapes, and it still informs, mm -hmm. and it guides how things appear to us. I would argue that when, have you had the uh, experience of you're driving by, or, uh, or you're on a bus, or a train, or whatever, and uh, or in a shape of a building, or, or a cloud, or a tree takes on something that appears meaningful, and then it's gone? Oh, yeah. I see that pretty much every day All when I time. drive to work. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a particular house I drive by that when I drive by it, it just it looks, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of changes each day depending on my mood mm -hmm. from what I've, I've yep. noticed. But yeah, it, it's a pretty interesting experience. So, so where is that coming from? You know, and, and people can talk about the unconscious or the subconscious or the pre-conscious. And the, one of the images that, I, wa, that was used once uh, when somebody was describing it to me was like, if you look at a bubble at the very t a tiny bubble uh, at the bottom of a glass of a carbonated beverage, that the bubble gets larger as it rises to the top and then it finally breaches the surface and pops. Imagine that, that uh, our, our perceptions, our thoughts, our awareness of what, what that house looks like or, or why you've pulled left instead of right is whatever it is that's guiding the little bubble to the surface that where it breaks and becomes part of our consciousness. And at some point, the bubble is so small that it was nothing. Where did it come from? In a lot of ways, that, that matrix or that deep place out of which the, if not if not our actual words and images, the steering of where those words and images ended up in our consciousness, that's also the noirs. So are there types of subtle energies that are only perceptible to the clairs and other types that are only perceptible to the noirs? Probably, though, you know, if, if anything I say would be you know, pretty random and pretty speculative because it falls into the category of I have an opinion, probably almost anybody who's worked with this stuff has an opinion, but honestly, until very recently, not enough people have actually been comparing notes to actually get a reasonable sense of, is this a defensible position or not? So, for example, I have a weird thing that happens once in a while with people that will end up being important in my life. Now, I can't tell you when this happens, is this person going to be a good thing or a bad thing in my life? Is this going to be joyous? Or is this going to be another one of those learning experiences? But almost all the people that have had a major and lasting connection or shaping influence on my life, either the first time I meet them or no more than like the second or third time I meet them, suddenly it's like floating around them. There are these little, little bubbles or little shapes. And sometimes they have words that I can read on them. And sometimes they have little symbolic things like this one looks like a little sword floating around there. And it's, it's almost like somebody has covered the person's aura with post-it notes with bits of information that I need to be aware of. That is completely in the realm of the Claris. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I am, I'm reading stuff that looks like words. I'm seeing visual imagery that is symbolic. I think that the Claris are, are more suited to representing information. However, you'll notice I said that that didn't necessarily tell me whether or not this person was going to be a source of joy or pain or both or, or somebody I'd have to work with for a variety of reasons, but it gives me no warning just that they're going to be important and here's some of the themes. There was a guy that I used to do readings for and he was not part of a magical community, not somebody of, of uh, that honestly I would choose to hang out with. Um, had uh, come to me uh, recommended by a friend of a friend to please, 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 uh, you know, pull out your tarot cards and do a reading for him. He's in a rough place. He needs some help. Okay. 
And more often than not, I, I'll, I'll say yes to things like that. So I did a reading, and I found him annoying in a lot of ways for personality reasons and politics and you name it. At the same time, I had a sense like, oh, man, there's a really good soul in there somewhere. And I thought that would be done. I'd be done with it. And um, nope. He, like a month and a half later, calls me up again. And again, I do another reading for him. This goes on for several years, by the way, and get to know more about him. And and I can honestly say that I'm I'm one of the busiest people I know. My my life is ridiculously overscheduled most of the time. So after the first couple of times, I was like, okay, I need guidance. Do I need to keep helping him, or can I I, I uh, you know draw a line and say, hey, we're done. I've, I've done what I can for you. Every single time, no words, no images, but this profound sense of he's a good guy you need to keep helping him is, is, is how i how i read that so you know after after all, doing all these readings for him i also was uh, you know began to know more about him and would, would uh, sometimes not let him leave my presence until he had checked his blood sugar because he was a, a diabetic and uh, by the way i was doing these readings for free because he was not in a position to pay for them and i bugged him about his diet and bugged him about a bunch of things and so eventually, you know, I didn't hear from him for a while, and then I got a call from his uh, wife saying he had passed on. And uh, I'd, I'd met her once or twice, and she, she wanted to thank me because she said, you know, he probably lived a couple of extra years because every time he went to see you for a reading, you badgered him about his health, and that probably kept him with me for a few more years, so thank you. So in the end, I think that the reason I always was getting that noir gut feeling of he's a really good guy, I need to help him, was that. Huh. And that's not something that, you know, showed up as an image in my mind or a, 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 a set of words, but, but sometimes the, the sense of what to do or not do. The friend I mentioned earlier who uh, claims that they're a total leadhead and probably, I don't expect I'll get much out of the book, but I'm going to read it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, they have spiritual beliefs, but they don't experience the spiritual world, okay? And yet... They often do things when they come to a ritual where, like, that was exactly the right thing that was needed. Why did you do that? It felt like the right thing to do. Why did you, why did you start? Why did you, where'd that chant come from? Why did you remember to, to, to offer up that song? It felt like the right thing to do. You know what? That's the noirs nudging the person because they're not getting the Pixar quality uh, images in their head or the, uh, you know, Dolby surround sound THX sound effects. They don't think that they're having a psychic experience. Mm, they're being yeah. guided yeah that's an interesting way to look at it man yeah and i mean I, I would agree too i've had that experience myself and i know a lot of people who are having them too you know it's like they get into this they're tapping into on some level these energetic sensations or messages but yeah. you know they're they're not fully like it's not a fully you know logical or conscious perception it is like we're talking about that sort of shadow noir perception and you know to this point i'm going to go off on a tangent here but i'm going to tie it back so just bear with sure. me but the word noir always makes me think of film noir, film which noir. is yeah, one of my favorite genres of film, to be honest. And one of my other favorite genres, though, is neo noir, which is, I, I guess, just a more mm -hmm. modern or contemporary style of it, right? right? right. So. I'm curious, in this vein, could we slap a neo-noir label on anything related to psychism? Has there been any new discoveries in psychism that are, you know, more modern and contemporary that's sort of built on this this idea of clairs and noirs, etc.? Hmm. I have to think about that. The, the, the first thing that came to mind was, was actually about everybody's uh, favorite hated thing to drag into discussions about magic or psychism and that is modern physics. But I'll, but I'll leave it at this. There, there does seem to be a, a certain amount of agreement in magic and in modern physics that the act of observation has an impact on things. So that uh, when you are attending to something, when you're focusing on something, there is an energetic exchange between you and that which you are trying to perceive or that which you are trying to receive. And that's definitely in the category of Claire's and the, the idea of your, of your perception having an impact on the thing that is trying to be seen. But also, and this is the part where it gets a little wonky that I'm going to throw in, I'm going to suggest that, that uh, the, the noirs or the, the, the subtle senses that are not flashy and explicit may be more closely aligned with, with the fabric of what makes 
the universe exists, but what makes space-time exist. I think it, it sounds counterproductive in some ways to view it this way, but I think that the noirs are also the the place where our talents to manifest things come from. In other words, it is the part of us that experiences the fabric of the universe, the underlying laws, both physical and metaphysical, the, the, the quantum frothing uncertainty of existence that's changing and coming into existence every moment. And when we make a change happen in the world through magic or spiritual means, I think that it is expressed through the noirs, not the clairs. We may need our psychism of, of, the, of the visual, auditory, sensory, normal sensory variety to do some choices and guidance and have an, a steering impact, but I think things come into being through the dark side. So, so, so in, in some regards, all magic that works has to, come, has to uh, come through the use of the noirs because it's about shaping reality. And the only way to shape reality is to be part of reality rather than to be the observer. All sense of oneness comes from, from being rather than observing. So totally off topic, but sort of on topic. Yeah. What's your favorite film noir film? <laughs> that makes sense. What's your favorite noir <laughs> film? <laughs> oh, good Lord. I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm, 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 I'm actually going to say something that is not what most people think, but I actually think of Vertigo as, as film noir of, of a sort. Hmm, yeah, I could see that. I mean, a lot of Hitchcock stuff, well, his early stuff, I guess, from like which the not, 40s, definitely. Yeah, which, but which, which definitely exploring the psychology more so than, mm -hmm. and, and definitely had the dark feel to it. Yeah, you know, you might actually consider that Neo because of the, nah, I guess, yeah, just because yeah. of the time period. But yeah, it does have, that, does have that, does have the uh, the noir tropes, not necessarily the same aesthetic, but yeah. Okay, so I got one more question for you, and... It's just very basic, you know, I want to I wanna give some practical advice here to people. So I just have a couple of terms here. If you could just give us a, a quick explanation of what they are and, and how we can, I guess, best tap into them. And if it's not a quick explanation, that's fine. But I'm just trying to make this, you know, sort of like a, another rapid fire way here to, to wrap up. So the first one I just wanted to mention was the intoning of E-A-O. That was pretty mm -hmm. cool. What What is that exactly and how can we do that? So... You've, you've probably heard the idea that uh, the vowel sounds are where uh, all the magic is and the consonants are the interruptions, which is why so many uh, chants are, are, are about focusing on the vowel sounds. How it came to me was through the ceremonial line and EIO representing many things like Isis, Apophis, and Osiris. And you can also view it as uh, from a purely biological perspective of the, the position of the tongue and the mouth forming the vowel sounds goes from goes through through the uh, possible permutations that contain the other vowels from a very closed to a very open. But it changes consciousness, and when you when you intone e a o e a o, and you can go in either direction, you end up with different effects. And keeping it short because you, there's other things to speak of. It is a quick way to alter consciousness and to change your relationship to your understanding of the flow of time and space around you. When you focus on the sound and you also feel it vibrating in the body because you, you have an entrainment of, of consciousness that's following the sound, it's also moving your physical body so there's an anchoring point between your physicality and following the riding the sound uh, as if it was a wave emanating from you but moving outwards. There's a lot that that very simple collection of sounds can, can produce. And I, I give a couple suggestions along with some breathing exercises and whatnot. Though I have to back up and say, if I can't have, if I can't have a Vertigo, and you're going to call it Neo Noir. <laughs> okay, be, yeah. If, you, if you're going to if you're going to give it that label, then I don't know. I'm I'm going to go with Kiss Me Deadly. Oh, I would not have expected that answer, but that's uh, that's a good one. I'd probably stick with Hitchcock, or maybe even go back to like a traditional like a Maltese Falcon. Like that's. That was my oh, first yeah, introduction yeah. to it, so I'm just partial to it, but there's also like Shadow of a Doubt from Hitchcock, which I enjoy, which right. probably be my, my right. favorite. So Kiss Me Deadly, yeah, that's a good answer, man. Okay, so... Anyway. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's a great tangent. We could talk about film all night. We could talk about film for this whole time, and I, I would have been content with the conversation. <laughs> but, <laughs> so... You mentioned breathing, some breathing exercises. Uh, fourfold breathing was in there. I was curious if you could just tell us a little bit about that, too. 
You know, uh, that one I teach to everybody, whether or not they're interested in magic or not. The idea is that, uh, you know, breath follows. Breath and consciousness are closely related to each other. And by paying attention to breath, you can change consciousness. If you think of uh, the four beats of your heart, you think of making your breath having a fourfold pattern by figuring out what's a comfortable length of time for you. And you take in a breath and count two, three, four, five, however number counts, and then hold your breath full for the same length of time, not clamping your throat, but just using the diaphragm. And then you exhale the same counting length of time, and then hold your lungs on empty with your diaphragm, not your throat, the same length of time. And you end up creating this slow rhythmic breathing with the inhale, the exhale, the full, and the empty like uh, the four seasons, like full moon, dark moon, and the quarters. So you create this pattern, and after a bit, your physical rhythms fall into line so that your breath, your heart, the fluid uh, pressure changes, the cerebrospinal fluid uh, pulse uh, lines with as well. Your aura begins to actually fall into alignment so that your different layers look tidier. It's almost like an a instant and quick way to align all your selves and it's good for getting ready for spiritual work, psychic work. It's good for when you're about to be interviewed for a job that you're trying to get and you're nervous because it settles you and uh, drops you back into alignment with uh, you know, being in the here and now. Yeah, and the last one I want to pull out here is give us some exercises that would help us pry open our third eye. Okay, pay attention to every little thing and amplify it. We talked about dreams briefly early on. Think of it as, as uh, amplification. So let's say that you were staring at somebody trying to uh, pick up their aura. Classic thing. Somebody standing against a blank wall, white preferably or light colored, and you're doing your off, off focus, you know, not trying to focus hard on them, but uh, just soft focus eyes, trying to see something. And you say, I don't really see anything. And after a while, well, maybe I see a little bit of a, of a, a waver around their body. And the moment you notice that waver, then pay attention just slightly for a second at one tiny piece. Don't try to see the whole thing. Try to see one little piece. And do the equivalent of a third eye squint. We've all squinted when we're trying to read a menu at a restaurant and we don't have our glasses or contacts or whatever where the light's too dim. And by squinting, we can force ourselves to read a couple of letters, a couple of words, and figure out what we want. When you notice the tiniest little detail, focus just on that little detail and squint. Metaphorically, focus your attention. Maybe that looks like a tiny little bit of yellow. Look closer. Now you know that there's a tiny little bit of yellow. Look again. Oh, okay, now I see that there's that uh, little bit of yellow, and now there's a little bit of blue, in it, and it's closer into their body. So basically, hold all the details, and then weave it together into, oh, what I actually saw was that uh, I could see three layers in your aura, and I could see that the following colors in your aura. Does that mean something to you? The point is, be satisfied at first with just piecing it together piece by piece by piece rather than expecting it to drop fully into your awareness. And in some ways, that's training yourself because every time you have a success, it convinces yourself that it can be done. Don't tell tales on yourself. There's a woman who was at one of our rituals who said, oh, after, afterwards when we're talking about what we experience, you guys are talking about all the stuff you saw and I don't see anything. And I said, well, what, what happened tonight? Oh, I don't know. I, it, it, it looked like when, when so-and-so was, was dancing that, you know, the, the floor rippled a little bit. Okay, so what did that remind you? Well, it act, I actually thought it reminded me of the ocean. I said, okay. And, and uh, what else happened? Well, it looked like, uh, like, uh, like there were, you know, the, the wind was moving through, through veil. Was she wearing a veil? No, but it looked like she was wearing, ah. So the more you ha I had her talking, the more she would begin to remember or notice because when it occurred in the moment, it was wispy. It was almost like seeing the, the, the suggestion of, of a veil, not an actual veil with, with texture that you could tell was silk or whatever. So that because each of the details was fleeting and small, she felt like she saw nothing. But when she actually said it out loud and pieced it together and filled in the gaps, crap, when I see all the dots and connect the lines, I actually had an experience. So I keep thinking about this, and I'm sorry. Kiss Me Deadly. That was a great choice, man. <laughs> that, well, no, I completely forgot about that. That's a great movie. That's got... Okay. That's a that's a Mick or a Mike Hammer character, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mickey Spillane novels, right? Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck on this just for the moment. But uh, it's got all, it's got all the kind of evil brutishness that yeah. you expect. But isn't there also, if I'm thinking of the right one, is, is there some science fiction stuff in there too? Well, kind of, sort of. I mean, there's there's a lot of 
like gargoyles and, and dark imagery all through the film. And it, it's also, I don't know, it's got echoes of Repo Man in it, frankly. It is the worst case scenario of, of capitalism gone mad. It's got all the, it's all, it's got all the, um, all, all the stuff in it is, is basically about the, the worst of, of Eisenhower's administration. It has all the political stuff, even, even though it's not a political movie, it, it just is dripping with, with everything that is, it, that is out of control in, in, in the world as a result of, of, you know, capitalism and might makes right and the rich versus the poor. It, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there besides just saying, hey, darkness and human weakness. Yeah, so I guess the, the two major takeaways from this chat are read your book, Keys to Perception. And then go watch Kiss Me Deadly again. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I lived in, in Florida during the Cuban Missile Crisis, so fear of nuclear bombs is something that it is deep in me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, so you and, think... You know, we, we, we've got a nuke in the movie. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. So you think, like, maybe that, that plot element sort of resonated with you somehow? I think it did. Interesting. Yeah, well, you've... Yeah, that's going to go... I hope it's streaming somewhere. I'm going to have to find that when we get off the call. <laughs> I bet you didn't expect to talk about 1950s film noir I'm sure, when you... <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I didn't. <laughs> well, my bad, but I think that's a great little... Uh, it's, there's nice wrinkles to these chats that I, I try to bring in, and I, I don't know where that one came from, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad it popped up. So, what we are near the end of our time here, and before we go, you know, I, I've mentioned the book, Keys of Perception. Where can they find the book, Evo, and where can they find you if they want more of your work as well? So, the good news is, Keys to Perception is through Wiser Books, which means that pretty much every bookstore can get it. Uh, support your local independent bookstore first. If that's not an option, then go to one of the chain stores. And of course, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all the big online stores have it as well. But go small and local if you can. EvoDominguezJr.com is my website and lists all the places that I go to. And because, uh, man, this year I'm going to a lot of different conferences and events, so you might be able to catch up with me. I've also got a bunch of other books, so you can check those out as well. Absolutely. And we will definitely link to the book to IndieBound.org so people Sweet. can find yeah, so people can find a copy either on there or at their local nearest independent right. bookseller for sure. So Evo Dominguez, dude, this was a great chat. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome back here anytime. It was a lot of fun. And there you have it. My thanks again to Evo Dominguez. Check him out at the links in the show notes. And check out Kiss Me Deadly if you're into film noir as much as we are. I thought this episode made a nice companion piece to the previous show with Dr. Dean Radin, where we talked about looking at psychic phenomena from a scientific perspective. And here Evo is telling us a bit about how to do it ourselves at a more fundamental level. So if you're at all interested in prying open that third eye and taking your own sigh out for a spin, Evo's book does serve as a handy roadmap. I also want to thank all of you who downloaded the antisocial commentary episode I uploaded, where I talked a bit about that Childish Gambino music video that got everyone on social media up in a tizzy last week. Usually those sorts of episodes don't get downloaded as much as the regular feature-length episodes, but this one did, and I was really glad it did. Received nothing but positive feedback on that, except from some YouTuber who told me not to get involved in this cultural war going on between left and right, which was far from what I was doing. I actually urged people not to get caught up in these socio-political theories and if it wasn't clear in that episode, I'll say it again here. Don't get caught up in the socio-political theater. It really is the society of the spectacle, and that harkens back to the episode with Gordon White a few months back where we talked about the engineered spectacle, the pro-wrestling paradigm that is America and geopolitics in general. And come to think of it, that recent Fiona Horn mini-episode got downloaded a lot as well. Worthy entries into the old culture canon, and if you only listen to the numbered episodes, but not the other content, hey, I get it. But I'd give those two a listen if you have time. Put them on 1.5 or 2x speed, and it'd take less than an hour to get through both of them. And if you like what you've been hearing, patreon.com slash occulture is the place to show some love. Four levels of support starting at just two bucks a month. I also recently connected Discord to my Patreon, so there'll be some Discord rewards coming up. Still trying to figure out what exactly they are. And I'm also looking at Twitch for some stuff, so might be some Twitch content coming up as well. Pay attention, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or right here on the mic. You'll hear it whenever it happens. 
I'm also trying to get some new merch going. I may forego the exclusive t-shirt thing I've been talking about and just go with the print-on-demand thing. Well, that's a lie. I won't forego the exclusive item thing entirely. There are things in the hopper that I think are quite cool but are expensive to produce in bulk because they're handmade. And if you've heard any of the episodes focus on astrology, there's a hint on what the next item may be. But anyway, I gotta get going before I get got, so until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself. Think for yourself and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.